Hello, today I'm going to answer a very simple question. Was Karl Barth a socialist? And the answer is, yes he was. Cool, well that was easy. Okay, I'll be a little bit more serious here. Um, the reality is, though, that there is no doubt that Karl Barth was a socialist at one point in time. He actually earned himself the reputation as being known as the Red Pastor from Safenville. And um, the question that I want to answer here, though, is whether or not Bart remained a socialist for the for the rest of his career, and to what extent his socialism informed or was informed by his theology. Um, and so, really, it's that question that I want to analyze in this video. Um, now, it is my position that Karl Barth uh, not only was a socialist for a time, but remained committed to socialism, or at the very least, to anti-capitalism throughout his entire career as a theologian. And more substantially, I think that Barth's theology is deeply interconnected with his political views, particularly his socialism. As George Hunsinger correctly notes, those who think they can have Barth's doctrine without his radical politics show they have yet to understand him. So we will begin with establishing Barth's socialism um, in his early career, um, specifically by looking at some a speech um, that he gave as a pastor, um, leading to his reputation as the Red Pastor from Safenville. Um, and then we'll move on to examine two places in Barth's later thought um, that I think demonstrate his continued commitment to socialism. Um, and then we'll look at a third biographical example as well. And then finally, we'll conclude this video with some reflections on the tendency uh, in scholarship to turn Bart into an apolitical theologian, uh, particularly among evangelicals. So with that said, let's get started. So a few examples from Bart's early speeches in Safenville will suffice to show his commitment to socialism as they're quite explicit in demonstrating this. Particularly, there's a very fascinating speech that he gave in 1911 entitled Jesus Christ and the Movement of Social Justice. In this, Bart declared, Jesus rejected the concept of private property. Of that, it seems to me there can be no doubt. He rejected precisely the principle that what's mine is mine. Now, the abolition of private property is a central tenet to socialism. Um, private property meaning here, of course, private ownership over the means of production, not personal property. Um, we can think of the distinction as the difference between a car factory and a personally owned car that drives a worker to the car factory. Um, so the point here is not really to rehash Marx's critique of capitalism, um, but merely to indicate how Barth's statement here does fall in line with some of the classic uh, tenets of socialism as such, uh, particularly its main goal, which is the abolition of private property. Now, another quote in the same speech um, is a little bit more direct. In this, this example, Bart explicitly aligns Christianity with socialism. Bart says, And now, to my socialist friends who are present, I have said that Jesus wanted what you want, that he wanted to help those who are least, that he wanted to establish the kingdom of God upon this earth, that he wanted to abolish self-seeking property, that he wanted to make persons into comrades. Your concerns are in line with the concerns of Jesus. Real socialism is real Christianity in our time. That last line is quite direct and it really couldn't be any clearer. Um, real socialism is real Christianity in our time. Now, we must kind of correct this statement um, by realizing that Bart's later thought became a little bit more skeptical of this sort of um, exact identification of a political system with the will of God. Um, for Bart, this was a realization that he came to through the existence of Nazism in Germany, um, that identifying a political system with the will of God um, and therefore objectifying God in any sort of political system is something that he came to reject uh, because of the Nazi ideology, which essentially did that very same thing. But these quotes are nonetheless sufficient to show Bart's early commitment to socialism. Um, now, we should also note that in a more official capacity, Bart had joined the Social Democratic Party twice, first in the Swiss Socialist Party in 1915, and then again, the German Social Democrats in 1932. And it was actually partially because of his refusal to give up party membership that he was dismissed from his university position during the Nazi regime. 
And so there's really no doubt that Bart was a socialist for a time. But now I want to demonstrate through some of Bart's later writings how that socialist commitment remained essential to his theology. Um, there's often a misconception that once Bart turned to dogmatics in his uh, more system building period, where he was actually writing the church dogmatics, um, that he left behind some of the political dimensions for more of a transcendental uh, theology, um, something divorced from reality, but um, or, or divorced from political reality. But that's just not the case. And I think this these examples show that quite well. The first example comes from Volume 3, Part Volume 4 of The Church Dogmatics. This volume is where Bart is dealing with the doctrine of creation, and this part volume is Bart's doctrine of the ethics of creation. Um, and in this volume, there's a very clear critique of capitalism. It's a very strong critique of capitalism. And we should note that this was written in 1951. It was first published in 1951 in the German edition. Um, and so this is very clearly a later uh, example of Bart's thought that still demonstrates a socialist commitment. Uh, the specific topic that Bart is dealing with here is kind of a theology of work. Um, within the larger doctrine of creation and the ethics of creation, he's dealing with the reflections on human freedom, uh, what it means to be the creature of God. Um, and so Bart argues that work should serve humanity, not humanity becoming enslaved by work. The latter takes place when work is solely oriented towards an inhumane goal such as the endless accumulation of capital. And so Bart is essentially describing uh, the capitalist situation of wage labor, uh, wherein the end goal of the process of um, capitalist mode of production is entirely for capital accumulation. Um, and so he quite directly writes the following. Capitalism is an unequivocally demonic process which consists in the amassing and multiplying of possessions expressed in financial calculations or miscalculations, that is, the capital which in the hands of the relatively few who pull all the strings may equally well be a source of salvation or perdition for whole nations or generations. Bart further notes that work under capitalism is, quote, performed in the name of a sinister and heartless and perpetually ambitious idol, end quote. Now, this is clearly the idol of capital itself, the idol of the accumulation of money. With these reflections, Bart is clearly criticizing capitalism as inherently alienating and dehumanizing, that it is a system which serves only the increase of capital at the expense of human well-being. Thus, the implication here is that this dehumanization of the creature of God through capitalism, specifically through the form of capitalist work, is at the same time a sin against the creator, against God, because as a dehumanization of the creature is at once an affront to God who is the Lord of the creature. So while this passage is not necessarily as explicit of an affirmation of socialism as his early speeches were, um, it is nonetheless a scathing critique of capitalism, a very clear one, calling it both demonic and in service to an idol. We could not imagine a more direct attack against capitalism as a system. Thus, Bart remained anti-capitalist even into his later dogmatic work, as this demonstrates. And remember that this text was written a full 40 years after his socialist speeches in Savenville. A second example I want to look at is Bart's understanding of God's solidarity with the poor and weak. There are two places for this. The more theologically substantial example comes from Bart's Doctrine of Reconciliation in Volume 4 of his Church Dogmatics, particularly Part 1 of that volume where he deals with the Son's humility. Um, Bart notes that it is not improper, but proper to the being of God that Jesus Christ would become low and humble. In other words, it is in God's nature to side with the poor and weak, to take up solidarity with them in their struggle. As Bart writes, God chooses condescension. He chooses humiliation, lowliness, and obedience. In this way, he illuminates the darkness, opening up that which is closed. In this way, he brings help where there is no other help. In this way, he accepts solidarity with the creature, with man, in order to reconcile man and the world with himself, in order to convert man and the world to himself. What we should 
pay attention to here is how Bart, uh, in describing the event of reconciliation, uses the humility of the Son as a mechanism towards that end. And so it's the, in the incarnation and God's willingness to become human and take up solidarity with us that God saves, that God reconciles the world back to himself. And so this connection is then further brought into the political realm in a somewhat overlooked essay that Bart wrote that's simply titled Poverty. It's in this essay that Bart writes, Christ was born in poverty in the stable at Bethlehem, and he died in extreme poverty, nailed naked to the cross. He is then the companion not of the rich men of this world, but of the poor of this world. For that reason, he called the poor blessed and not the rich. For that reason, he is here and now always to be found in the company of the hungry, the homeless, the naked, the sick, and the prisoners. The connection to Bart's Christology and Doctrine of Reconciliation should be clear. Uh, because Christ took up solidarity with the poor and underprivileged, this indicates God's preference for the poor, that God calls the poor blessed and not the rich. In fact, in Luke 6, Jesus condemned the rich quite explicitly, declaring, Woe to you who are rich in this life. Now, it's important to see the connection here between Bart's Christology and his politics. In the same essay, Bart further notes that there is no place in the Bible where the rich are called blessed. But there are many, many places where the poor are blessed and exalted. He indicates how, in some sense, the very word for the righteous is sometimes synonymous with the poor. Bart writes, The gospel was proclaimed to the poor, while on the contrary the rich are often shown in suspiciously close proximity to the mighty evildoers whose pride goes before the fall. Bart is arguing here that God takes side with the poor. And in many regards, this is reminiscent of what later liberation theologians would call God's preferential option for the poor. And Bart comes to this conclusion. He whom the Bible calls God is on the side of the poor. Therefore, the Christian attitude to poverty can consist only of a corresponding allegiance. Bart is making a direct call to action with this conclusion. The Christian is one who takes up side with the poor. Uh, there can be no neutrality and in a system of injustice, and the issue of poverty is no exception. Thus, to follow Christ is to follow him on the way of poverty and solidarity with those who struggle. The heart of Bart's theology with the doctrine of reconciliation is thus directly connected with his political commitment to socialism. The doctrine of reconciliation is central to Bart's entire dogmatics, and it would be a mistake to overlook how much his insights on this subject inform his political convictions regarding poverty and socialism. Because God is the one who humbled God's self in the incarnation, so God is the God of the poor. Indeed, we do not truly know Bart's theology until we learn his radical politics. Now, there's a final example that comes directly from Bart's life. Um, in the midst of the Cold War, Bart refused to engage in anti-communism or red bashing, um, as was common for many people to do, especially those in America at the time under the McCarthy era. Um, he received much negative attention for this decision, specifically uh, two issues, um, his stance on Hungary and his stance on the GDR or East Germany. Um, but he stood by his conviction nonetheless. Christine Tietz's new biography uh, on Bart details this episode of his life very well, and so if you want to read more about it, um, I recommend you picking up a copy. Um, I have a review of that particular book on my website, and I'll, I'll link it down below. But in brief, during this time of Bart's life, he spoke out against anti-communism both during and after his visit to Hungary. He spoke to the churches and told them that he did not think there was any reason to immediately say no to the political changes that were taking place, but instead to, quote, wait a little and observe the matter in detail, end quote. Bart is referring to the political development of the Hungarian People's Republic, which was a socialist state under the governance of the USSR. Um, Bart was severely criticized for being soft on this development, for being soft on communism, especially by the American theologian Reinhard Niebuhr, who publicly asked why Bart was being silent about Hungary. Emil Brunner was also quite vehement against Bart for this stance, um, and he wrote 
directly to Bart, saying that he of all people should understand the threat of communism. Bart's response to this came in the form of an open letter in which he explained his rejection of principled anti-communism. The church does not deal timelessly with these or those isms and systems, but always with the historical reality in the light of the word of God and faith. It thinks, speaks, and acts for that reason never on principle, but rather from case to case. So Bart was not willing to engage in the McCarthyite witch hunt of blind anti-communism. And interestingly, he also refused to engage in any sort of uh, critique of the communist system that did not first take seriously some of the valid social criticisms that communism brought forth against the capitalist system itself. So in other words, he did not find it necessary to outright reject communism without also soberly assessing the social questions that it raised against the Western capitalist system. Bart repeated these reservations against blind anti-communism when he addressed the issue of the GDR or East Germany. He did not think a Christian should engage in wholesale resistance against communism in principle, but suggested instead to take the issue on a case-by-case basis. He even went so far as to call the GDR God's beloved Eastern Zone. When Bart gifted Eberhard Jungel all the volumes currently published in the Church Dogmatics, he inscribed them with this, To Eberhard Jungel on the way to God's beloved Eastern Zone. Now, all of this is not to say that Bart was blind to the intense struggle and suffering of those who were living in the communist bloc, um, but he simply did not think that a rampant and blind anti-communism was the solution to those issues. Rather, he strived towards a better justice than either the communist or the capitalist system had arrived at. And so, in a sense, Bart was striving towards a third way between both Western capitalism and Eastern communism. And so, for those in the West, he was a voice against blind anti-communism, even while at the same time, he was clearly aware and truly concerned about the suffering of those who were on the Eastern side on the communist bloc. But himself, being part of the West, he refused to engage in that blind anti-communism by principle. So what exactly does this tell us about Bart's political commitments? While he was certainly critical of the USSR and the Soviet system, he was not willing to also let the West off the hook by totally ignoring the valid critiques against the um, issues of capitalism, which communism had posed. And so, in the sense, Bart was politically restating Jesus' famous remark to first take the log out of our own eye before criticizing the speck in another's eye. And in another sense, Bart was striving to de-objectify the word of God in the political environment. And this is where the connection to his theology becomes clear. God is not a Westerner, uh, nor is God so easily ascribed to the Western systems of power any more than God could be ascribed to the Eastern systems of power. God remains for Bart non-objectifiable. God cannot become the puppet in the hands of any political system. And so this central commitment of his theology is vital for us to see, and especially to see the connection between that and his political uh, approach to the blind anti-communism and his desire for a third way between both the East and West solutions. And so he accepted the faults of communism. He certainly was strong on those as well, but he wasn't accepting the position of just a blind anti-communism, almost the demonization of an entire block of people, uh, strictly based on that principle. And so there's a certain wisdom to what Bart's doing, but I think the theological implications are just as important, because we see with this Bart's commitment to the de-objectification of God, that God cannot become an object of theological or political um, ownership for human beings. But at the end of the day, whatever we think of the situation and whether Bart was right or wrong to make these judgments, it is a good historical example from Bart's life of his tendency towards anti-capitalism. He may not explicitly affirm socialism in these things, in these situations as he did in 1911, but this is certainly a good example of his theological commitments finding their way into the political realm. So those are the three examples that I wanted to bring for why I think Bart remained at least anti-capitalist, if not fully socialist, for the entirety of his life. 
Um, and most of all, even if you d disagree with that conclusion, I think it's important to stress the political nature of Barth's theology. In other words, Barth's theology cannot be depoliticized. Um, even though there's this strange tendency within English-speaking, typically American scholarship about Bart to depoliticize his work, I think that that's a mistake. And I do think that we have to rest restate Hunsinger's earlier point that we cannot truly have Bart's theology without his radical politics, because the two go hand in hand. They are deeply intertwined with one another. Bart's socialism is deeply rooted in his doctrine of God, his doctrine of Christ, and of reconciliation. Um, and his desire for a third way during the Cold War indicates his desire to retain God's non-objectifiability in human political systems. And so the point here is that Bart's theology and his politics are deeply interwoven. As Bart himself has even said, the church cannot on any account be unpolitical. So we cannot make the mistake of depoliticizing Bart, and any apolitical reading of his theology should be judged as a misreading. So that is why I think Bart remained a socialist for his entire life, even into his dogmatic work. Or at the very least, I think that we have to say that Bart remained anti-capitalist. So with that said, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I'd love to hear what you think about it in the comments below. Um, but for now, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.